into a coma, and then she died. Okay. She was only 24. 24 at the time. Now her sibling, her surviving twin, started to also demonstrate these symptoms. Okay. Now they thought that, you know, like twins, when if you're identical twins, which they were, if one twins experience some kind of um, thing going on with their life, it's also said that their sibling also experiences the same thing, right? So what they were saying is probably she's just going through some sympathetic thing that her sister was going through. Well, sure enough, it continued, so her symptoms also became worse, and they were running a gamut of tests. Again, they still could not figure out what was going on. So now they're thinking, okay, maybe it's environmental. They started to retrace the activities of both the girls, where they went, where they slept, where they frequently visited, the foods that they ate. <coughs> Could it be their car? Okay, so I mean, they were trying to just get a start somewhere because they didn't know where to start until someone says, you know what, let's look at where they live. So they went to where they live. They examined the rooms, the house. Everything looked fine. Everything looked perfect. They thought it might have been the electrical system because it may have been given off strong EMFs. Okay, because you know EMFs can cause uh, neurological changes. It wasn't until they went up to the attic. And in the attic, right on the side of where the girl's bedroom was, was completely black. Mold? With mold. Black with mold. Mold eats up your brain, okay? It destroys your brain. That's why she was constantly dizzy, constantly in and out of lucidness, having seizures, having convulsions, okay? Extreme diarrhea, extreme vomiting, got very, very sick. They were able to catch it on time. She did have some minor brain damage, okay? But they caught it on time, yeah. and she survived. She just recently graduated from, from college. But, I mean, not a day goes by that we think about, you know, my cousin who passed away and what could have been done. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about mold that you find in your bathrooms. I'm talking about the entire ceiling attic was completely black. It looked like tar. Okay? All right. Parasites. Any questions on fungus? Any questions on bacteria? All right, let's talk about parasites. Parasites are organisms that live on or in other organisms. Okay. I knew of a parasite. I was married to her for several years. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> yep. Parasite. Okay. <laughs> can be a plant or an animal. Two classifications, you've got protozoa and helminths. Let's talk about protozoa. Protozoa is also single cell. They are eukaryotic, having a nucleus as well as organelles. Now, when compared to bacteria, they're gonna be larger in size. When compared to bacteria, they're gonna be larger in size. They are described by the way they move, their motility. They either move by a flagella, like a tadpole, so it has a little tail that whips them <coughs> into motion. Or they can have hair-like structures, like your eyelashes, surrounding the cell. This is known as cilia. So you either have a tail or hair-like projections from the cell, like eyelashes, known as cilia. They have parasitic characteristics. In other words, they are able to ingest food particles and have a simple digestive system. It reminds me of a Pac-Man. Okay. They have cysts. Okay. Remember in bacteria, there was a protective coating around that that was known as an endospore. You guys remember that? With protozoas, they can also have a protective coating. And these are known as cysts. The wall is resistant to any type of chemical and physical changes and they can, it allows them to live outside of their host. It allows them to survive outside of their host. Okay, any questions on protozoa? I'm keeping it basic, guys. Keeping it very, very basic. If you 
you want to know about it, more, more about it, then you can either uh, take up microbiology or you can Google it. I've learned so much on Google. <laughs> I'm so glad it exists. Helmets. Helmets are just basically worms. Okay? They're parasitic worms. They usually live in the intestinal tract of humans. You've got two types. You've got your platy helmets, which are flatworms. And you've got your ashelmints, which are your round worms. Ashelmints, which are your round worms. These include your pinworms, tapeworms, and trichinosis. We all know about worms, right? They can grow to the length of your entire uh, intestinal tract. You can usually get it from dirty, wo uh, dirty water and also contaminated foods. Okay, any questions on helmets? Okay, viruses. Viruses are simple organisms. They are neither prokaryotic or eukaryotic. However, they do carry their own genetic information, just like the bacteria, in either the form of DNA or RNA, one or the other, never both. It's going to be one or the other, never both. You guys got that? Viruses are obligatory, which means that they take advantage of a certain type of situation. Okay, they're very obligatory. They are intracellular and they are parasitic-like. Again, they're not parasites, they're parasitic-like. So what happens here is think of it like a mosquito. The virus itself, the virus is going to attach itself to a cell. It's going to inject their DNA or RNA code their genomes into that cell and cause it to perform its function. So the cellular, it's the cell itself loses its identity and it's now behaving and operating in the instructions that were given by the virus. Very similar to a computer virus, that's where the computer virus got its name. The computer gets infected with its own information and now your computer can't do its normal function, right? It doesn't do what you want it to do because the virus is telling it what it, it, it wants to do. Same thing at the cellular level. Nothing you can do about it, okay? So it uses the host cell's organelles and metabolic function to produce new viruses. New viral particles are then released, oftentimes resulting in the death of the host cell. So once they are done with the host, host cell, the cell dies, Okay? And then they go on and, and affect other healthy cells to do its bidding. Okay? Any questions on the virus? Okay. Remember the cycle infection that we talked about about an hour ago? Don't tell me you guys forgot it already. Okay. The cycle infection, five steps. Let's talk about these individually. The first one here is the infectious host. The infectious host. They can be the sick or the diseased. They can be living or even dead. Okay? You can have infections on dead things. As long as there is ample nutrients on that substance, to allow the, um, allow the um, germs to, to thrive, okay? Let's talk about carrier. <clears throat> Again, we are all walking hotbeds of different types of infections. We're just not showing them because we're healthy. But we are all some kind of carriers of some kind of disease, right? So that is what a carrier is. Essentially what a carrier is, is a healthy individual that have these pathogens living in them without demonstration of the symptoms. No demonstration of the symptoms. I gave you guys some examples here. The first one here is Staphylococcus aureus. Staph is a bacterial infection, so it can cause skin lesions, it can cause pneumonia, it can cause food poisoning. Okay, but also toxic shock and also blood poisoning. Okay, but it is bacterial. So you can carry 
this germ without having to present any of the symptoms. <laughs> However, if you do come in contact with someone who may have decreased immunity or someone who is susceptible to illnesses, they can acquire this and also get sick. Okay. Second one here is typhoid Mary. Typhoid is a bacterial type of infection usually caused by salmonella. You guys ever hear of salmonella? Mm -hmm. okay. Most commonly uh, you will hear about salmonella with chicken, right? Uncooked chicken and the way you handle chicken because there's bacteria in those things that if, it, uh, if the chicken is un, uh, not properly handled, you can get very sick. Typhoid Mary, okay, she was just called Mary back in the 1920s. Mary was a cook to a very prominent family in the Hamptons. You guys know where the Hamptons are? It's in upstate New York, okay? You gotta have money to be there. It even costs money to visit and vacation there. But St. Hamptons is a very affluent area. So you had Mary who was a cook for this prominent family. Essentially what happened is you had members of the family falling ill. They had diarrhea, they had vomiting, they went to the hospital, got treated and they were fine. Okay, so they just thought of it as just basic food poisoning. However, the number of visits increased from other prominent people in the area. So now it goes, was, just wasn't two or three, now you had maybe four, five, 10, 20, 60, over 100 people showing up to these hospitals with the same symptoms. They didn't have the CDC back then, so now they're trying to figure out how, are, why, how and why are these people getting sick. <clears throat> One thing that they had in common, they found out, was Mary. Mary, was not only a cook for that one prominent family, but she was also a cook to various families in that area. So they linked the sickness of typhoid to Mary. That's how she got her name. Now typhoid, again, is, is bacterial and can be easily transferred. So this is what she would do. She'd be cooking. She would scratch her booty. <laughs> okay, and continue to handle her cooking instruments again. Okay? That's how the bacteria was getting into the foods. Okay? So once they found out, they told, her to, they told her to stop, stop doing it. So she did for a little while. Okay? She didn't make a living, so she started doing it again. And when they found out that she was doing it again, after they told her not to, they put her in jail. So there was over 100 cases of typhoid in one, one uh, isolated area and I think it resulted in two deaths, okay? But most of them did survive that. So that's typhoid. Now, here's also human immunodeficiency or HIV. Basically what HIV does is that it compromises the immunity of the individual, making it very difficult to fight off any type of infections, okay? So HIV is a virus that causes AIDS, autoimmune, autoimmune disease syndrome, okay? So what that does, again, is that it renders you to fight any infection. So when somebody gets really sick and they die from those complications, remember is that they don't die from AIDS, they died from a complications of AIDS due to other infections. That's what AIDS is, okay? So you're dying from another, another type of infection, usually like pneumonia or some sort of, uh, of herpes. Okay, so who do we know has HIV and is still alive? Magic Johnson. You guys all know Magic Johnson? He looks pretty healthy. <laughs> Magic Johnson played for many years as a Laker, Los Angeles Laker, one of the best basketball players that ever lived. And when they found out that he had AIDS, they basically benched him until they found out a little bit more and understood what AIDS was all about. But then they allowed him to continue some more after that. But AIDS is, is transferred, uh, HIV and AIDS is transferred through, through blood. Okay? And if you have a break in the skin barrier, that allows this, this virus to enter the other body's um, uh, system. Anyways, Irvin Magic Johnson would get sick, but then he would get better. He had the virus, but he was just like any other human being. He would get sick and get better. 
and it's still bewildering as to how this is happening. And they still don't know how this is happening. Okay, but he's healthy, he's still alive. He's a great entrepreneur, he's invested a lot of money, put a lot of the money back into the community, and he's still alive. He was diagnosed with HIV, what, what, what 30 yeah, years ago? Late 80s, yeah. Yeah, we're talking about 30, 40 years ago, and he's still alive. I know one other person who has HIV and still lives, okay? I don't know him personally, but he's a, a friend of a friend, of a friend, okay? So a friend of mine has a friend who was in the military, the army. They did some random blood testing and it was found out that he had HIV. Well, okay, to protect the, the rest of the people in, the, in his outfit, they discharged him, they charged him with a medical leave, and they also gave him a full uh, benefits package, including a payroll. So they, they paid him and they said, this is your benefit package. Not knowing, or they thought that maybe he was going to go within a few months or a year. Okay? He's still alive. He's still healthy. He's like Magic Johnson. And for about 20 years, he's been receiving a paycheck. How do you like that? Receiving a paycheck and not having to, to work. That was, that was this guy. His name was, uh, his name was uh, Howard Cherry. Love that name. <laughs> Howard Cherry, how appropriate. Okay, number two is the reservoir for infection. Are you guys awake? I'm losing you guys. You guys better please stay awake. If you need to, stand up and stretch. Did you guys bring your food and snacks? Okay, stay awake. Reservoir for infection. So the source of the reservoir of infection is any suitable place where pathogens can thrive. Can thrive in sufficient numbers. Okay, pathogens like to live in moist, warm, dark places. And if there's enough nutrients there, they can thrive and they can multiply. But remember that they like to live in warm, dark, moist environments with enough nutrients. Okay, That's where pathogens like to thrive. Sources of infection includes patients with hepatitis, Someone like you and I who may have an upper respiratory infection or also a linen handler who's coming in contact with clean linen and rubbing off their soft skin on this linen and now people are acquiring uh, staph, staph infections, okay? Humans are the most common reservoirs. Humans are the most common reservoirs. The other reservoir would be contaminated foods and drinks. That's secondary. But most of the disinfections come from human beings. Okay. Any questions? So once it's thrived, now it needs a way to leave the original host. And it's got to find a way to make an exit. This exit can come by way of your nose, mouth, Again, your intestines can be, when we're talking about intestines, I'm talking about it in general generality. I'm talking about from the mouth, through the esophagus, the stomach, small and large intestines, and all the way down to the anal canal. That's what I mean by intestines. It's very general. Okay? Your other exit portal can be your urinary tract. Or also, remember what is your best line of defense? Skin. Skin, okay, so it may come from the open wound. Don't we'll exit the open wound, okay? The short exit portal. Now, how is it going to be transmitted into the new host? The most direct way to intervene in the cycle of infection is to prevent transmission. To prevent transmission. So we're trying to cut it off at the path. How are we going to cut off transmission, guys? By what? Sneeze into your elbow. Okay, what's that? Sneeze into your elbow. Sneeze into your elbow, okay. So, PPE. PPE. Remember your protective personal device uh, equipment. Also, practicing medical asepsis, killing them before they spread. Okay. So we're going to cut them off at the pass. So from the reservoir to the susceptible host, there are three routes of transmission. The first one here is direct contact. Second one is indirect contact. The third one here is droplet uh, contamination. The first mode of transmission through direct contact is 
we're talking about any type of infections or contamination that is spread by, and I'm just going to keep this very short and simple, from person to person is direct contact. The spread of contamination from one person to another person, this is direct. Examples of direct contact includes touching, kissing, sexual contact, contact with oral secretions, and contact with any body lesions. I'm going to talk about needle stick here in just a moment, okay, but it's person to person. Has everybody got that? The second one here is indirect contact. Indirect contact. Again, I'm going to make this simple. It goes from person to object to person. There's a middleman. This is a contaminated object. This contaminated object is known as a fomite. A fomite is any inanimate object that's been contaminated by an infectious person. Okay? So this includes your x-ray table, wound dressings, clothing, medical equipment, and instruments. But these are all inanimate objects, non-living objects. Person to object to person is indirect contact. Now if you go back here in this definition of a fomite, remember a fomite is any contaminated objects. Okay? You guys following me? Okay? And indirect goes from person to object to person. With the exception, are you guys with me here? With the exception of a contaminated needle. If you get stuck with a contaminated needle, this falls under the category of direct contact. Okay, it falls under the category of direct contact. Is the dirty needle also called a fomite? Yeah. The answer is yes. It still is a fomite. It is a contaminated object. However, it falls under the category of person to person. Is there a specific reason why that's the exception? Or? You know what? It's they don't look at it as if an, as an object. They look at it as more of an infected person going on to an uninfected person. I've asked nurses this. They couldn't tell me that. They could say that as long as they've known. Because I've been teaching this for a while. And finally I said, you know what? Why is it called that? And I looked up in a bunch of literatures and I went to the source themselves. I asked the directors of the nurses downstairs. I said, can you tell me why this is considered direct? She says, that's just the way it's always been. I said, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll go with that. Maybe just because it contains the bodily fluids or the bodily it could be. of the person. It could be, but then what happens to cups? Okay. What happens to cups, right? Now you know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're transferring your food on a cup and another person serves your cup, that's not considered direct. It's considered indirect. It's in indirect. It could also be because it's not disposed of properly, like it should have been. I don't know. Hey, maybe that's a good paper to write on. There could be Who wants to do the research? A needle stick? <laughs> yeah. Why it's called direct. Okay. When you find out, let me know. <laughs> Extra credit. All right, next one here is droplet contact. Droplet contact refers to infectious secretions. Coming from example, the conjunctiva. Those are the tear ducts, the nose, or the mouth. Have you guys ever heard of conjunctivitis? Okay. Conjunctivitis, you guys know what conjunctivitis is? Pink eye. Pink eye. If you have pink eye, you're going to come to work. Better not. Okay? It is highly contagious. Highly contagious. Okay? Do not come to work if you have pink eye. If you have kids who have pink eye, aren't they calling you on the phone right away? Come pick up your kid. We don't want them here. Examples of tropic contamination often occurs when an infectious individual cough, sneezes, or speaks in the vicinity of a susceptible host. Safe zone, write this down somewhere, is approximately three feet. It's approximately three feet. So if you're coughing, sneezing, or talking in my vicinity, don't be offended if you see me do this. <laughs> I'm just trying to create a safe zone so I don't get sick. Okay? If, a healthy, uh, if healthy people inhale the infectious droplets or if the contaminated droplets 
land directly in their eyes, nose, or mouth, they can increase their chances of being sick. Okay, the vehicle, there may be some overlaps over here, okay? So it can be more than one thing. We talked about direct, indirect, and also droplet, okay? But it can also be by way of airborne or vector. A vehicle is the mode of transmission such as food, water, blood, and other bodily fluids. We'll talk about airborne and vector. Remember what we talked about droplets? Droplets are moist. Airborne are evaporated droplets. Okay? Airborne refers to the inhalation of suspended evaporated droplets of the diseased microorganism. One is moist, the other one is not moist. It's evaporated. That's airborne. <clears throat> the next one here is a vector. A vector is an insect or any living carrier that transmits an infectious agent. Okay? Pay attention to the examples I gave you. Usually insects, mosquitoes that carry malaria, fleas that carry the bubonic plague, dogs and bats which carries rabies. Rabies. Do you guys know? Have you guys heard about the uh, bubonic plague? This plague nearly wiped out Europe. Nearly wiped out Europe. It killed. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Okay? Here's the irony. Fleas were found on rats. Usually rats. Okay? Originally, they thought that the bubonic plague was being carried by the cats. So they got rid of the cat population which now left the culprit, which were the rats. They continued to multiply and multiply and multiply, and then the bubonic plague spread epidemically throughout Europe. They got rid of the cats. Well, they should got rid of the rats. Now, you don't have the cats to get rid of the rats. Okay, so after the mode of transmission, now we are gonna find an entryway into our new host. The entryway could be the same. It could be the eyes, nose, mouth, intestine, okay? So it can be uh, enter the new host by way of ingestion, inhalation, injection, and across the mucous membrane. These susceptible hosts are frequently individuals whose impaired health have reduced their natural resistance to infection. So again, we talked about someone who may have a compromised immunity. There's a greater chance of them getting sick. In addition to the primary problem that has caused their hospitalization, can you get a secondary infection? Yes. Okay, remember that's called nosocomial, right? Hospital acquired infections pose a great threat to healthcare workers as well. So it's not just the patients, but it's also dangerous to us. Nosocomial infections occur during hospitalizations or medical procedures. They are extremely dangerous, possibly resulting in bed sores, illness, or even death. There has been an increased number of ER patients, so the screening process isn't as, as more complex than, let's say, an outpatient coming to the hospital. When someone comes to the ER, we're just trying to save their life, okay? We don't have a good, thorough type of screening process, so they may be bringing something to the hospital by way of the ER. There has been a resurgence of tuberculosis and other diseases through uh, that were thought to be wiped out, but we have immigrants coming from second and third world countries. They live in an environment that is that not by choice, it's just dirty. Okay, they may be living in rubbish, they may be living in areas where it's you know a lot of a lot of dirt, which can harbor a lot of microorganisms as well. And now they're bringing this into the United States, and so there has been a resurgence of tuberculosis, urinary tract, and bloodstream is going to be the primary delivery of these type of infections. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Now your immune system, <clears throat> remember it begins at, at, at birth. And your constant exposure to the different elements, preschool, for example, 
Now, antigens are foreign and unrecognizable organic substances that invade the body. So this is the invader, is the antigens. Your antibodies are what's going to prevent these antigens from causing you to get sick. So antibodies are produced as a response to, again, as a child. Antibodies are found in tears, saliva, the spinal fluid, and also colostrum, or colostrum. What is colostrum? Breast milk. Breast milk, it's mother's milk. It's full of antibodies. Okay. You can also get these antibodies by way of getting an artificial introduction to it. This is called vaccination. So you as an individual, usually happens when you're young, you get vaccinated. And they're actually vaccinating you with some kind of pathological microorganism, but it's dead. Your body recognizes it, and it starts to build these antibodies. And this is, how, this is why you get your measles shots, your mumps, your chicken pox, your smallpox, uh, and some other things. Okay, This is what you get as a kid. This is how we help you build your immunity. Or you can go one of those to chicken pox parties. Okay, autoimmune disease. This is where the individual's own antibodies destroy healthy tissue. So now it's your body attacking good, good cells. This includes rheumatoid arthritis and also multiple sclerosis. Let's talk about the infectious process. So once you as a host gets an infection, let's talk about the different stages. The first one here is the incubation stage. Incubation stage. So the pathogen remains dormant and there may be no specific symptoms. Okay, so right now we're all in the incubation stage.